Hello. <laughs> I'm Jane Wolf. I'm the director of the uh, master's program in landscape architecture here at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, uh, Landscape and Design. Uh, thank you all for coming. We have the great um, honor and uh, pleasure of um, hearing tonight from William Morris, who's this year's uh, Michael Huff OALA um, visiting critic uh, in landscape architecture. And I want to say that this appointment um, is made possible with the generous support of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects, which uh, in 2003 established an endowment uh, at our faculty to enrich the academic experience of students in our Masters of Landscape Architecture program and other programs. Um, the OALA's support enables Daniel students to benefit from the creative input of outstanding visiting professors, uh, practitioners, and critics um, in the landscape architecture field. And I think one thing that's particularly lovely uh, um, about our appointment this year of uh, William Morris is that um, he has been a longtime friend and uh, colleague of Michael Huff, in whose honor uh, the, the um, visiting uh, critic position was endowed. Um, we'll be joined later by Glenn O'Connor, who's the president of the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects. Um, but in the meantime, I want to introduce my colleague, Assistant Professor Elise Shelley, uh, who represents the Daniels faculty on the OALA uh, Governing um, Council and who does yeoman service in that, uh, in that uh, position of responsibility to say a few words on behalf of the OALA. Thank you. Yes, I have the lofty title of the U of T appointed educator on the Council for the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects. And, you know, many of you in the landscape architecture department may get, you know, frequent emails advertising things like ski day and golf day and a variety of exciting activities, including at the end of this week, we have our annual general meeting to which everyone is certainly welcome if you'd like to pay your fee. Um, we will have some uh, display of work and the, the OALA is a great supporter of our school and as one of two um, uh, landscape architecture programs in Ontario that they support, they're always very interested to know what we're doing and very excited to support programs that we bring to them, scholarships, special activities that we do throughout the year, travel, symposium, and of course the OALA um, endowment that is given annually for the Huff OALA lecture. So very pleased to be wearing the OALA hat tonight and to be able to welcome Bill Morris here this evening. Well, just a few words about Bill before he uh, starts talking. Um, he is at present the Dean of the School of Constructed Environments at Parsons, the new school of design in New York City, where um, the faculty includes an amazing range of disciplines from lighting designers to product designers to interior design to environmental design and and, oh, and architects. Um, <laughs> so a kind of incredible uh, range of disciplines and before that he was the Elwood R. Casada Chair in Architecture, Landscape Architecture, and Urban Planning uh, at the University of Virginia. And I think he was is the only person in the history of that institution to have been appointed in all three uh, disciplines simultaneously, which makes him a very interesting speaker at our faculty. Um, before that, he and his late wife, Catherine Brown, founded the Design Center for the American Urban Landscape at the University of Minnesota. And before that, he worked as an architect and landscape architect and urban designer and uh, teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. Um, and before that, I happen to know that he grew up in the great Central Valley of California, which is um, something I think we're going to about to hear more about. He, he's worked on a really amazing um, range of products, for, uh, projects, sorry, from a series of studies that uh, examined urban landscapes in Minneapolis and St. Paul, a kind of epic uh, journey up the Mississippi River recorded in a special issue of Design Quarterly. Uh, he worked on the Think T 
team uh, f on a proposal for the redesign of the World Trade Center after September 11th. Uh, he's been uh, intensely involved in the rehabilitation of post-Katrina New Orleans. He's at work now um, on um, projects in Thailand, so very far uh, corners of the world. And for all of this, he was described uh, in the middle 1990s by the architecture critic of the New York Times, Herbert New Mouchamp, as I want to make sure I get this right, the most valuable thinker uh, in urbanism today. And I think um, Bill is a really amazing fit as a speaker for uh, our program because for 40 years, more than 40 years, our landscape program has really committed itself to understanding the relationships among design, ecology, and culture in urban landscapes. And that's, that's really um, Bill's... Um, Bill's bailiwick. He's a, a synthetic thinker, uh, an inclusive thinker, uh, a generous thinker. And I'll also make a confession, which is that, although I'm always glad to see him for those very high-minded reasons, uh, <laughs> I like it even better that I can pretty well count on his saying something funny. Uh, he's usually irreverent. He's always um, surprising. Uh, and he loves, loves, loves to draw. So before I welcome Bill, and uh, again, welcome to all of you, I noticed that Glenn O'Connor has made his way through a traffic jam. Uh, and maybe we'll um, say something on behalf of the OALA. Would you like to do that? OK, great. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my apologies for being late. Uh, I'm Glenn O'Connor, president of OALA. Simply like to uh, say that OALA is pleased to continue to support U of T, and we're always uh, supportive of students and programs because you're the future professional. So, uh, on behalf of Council, I just bring greetings and uh, thank you for um, allowing us to participate in the lecture series. So, I'm looking forward to the lecture tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's really um, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had no idea Ola meant Ontario uh, Association of Landscape Architects. I'll have to give all my Colombian friends a different uh, definition of that. Uh, but it's, it's a real honor to be here. As, as, as Jane said, I've, I've known Michael's work for a long, long time. Pathfinding, pioneering, um, really pretty much a quiet voice for a long time, actually, his book. And then all of a sudden, everybody said, have you ever heard of Michael Huff? And a lot of us, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's been out there. Um, and Jane Wolf, who is um, an amazing uh, colleague um, and always an inspiration, and uh, uh, as we all know, has some of the most amazing quotes uh, to identify a particular situation. Uh, I, I said this because I've been in class with you all for the last two days, and I want to thank all the students for suffering through my comments, and, um, and I've really enjoyed uh, the conversation. It gives me uh, great hope that there's energy and, and a real earnest um, uh, desire to take on these uh, very complicated and wicked problems. Um, and, and after I'm done, you can work over my thesis too, if you would like, because uh, it is definitely open. I, I start out with this picture because uh, Jane likes ditches, and, um, and, and that's where I grow up. That's not me, that's somebody in the 1940s who's the uh, irrigation manager uh, sitting out on a ditch in the San Joaquin Valley in uh, south of Fresno, where if you want to know where raisins come from, uh, that's where it comes from, uh, because with uh, summer of over 110 degrees, everything turns to raisins. It's not hard to make. Um, but it's this industrial landscape uh, uh, which uh, has uh, affected my understanding of many, many things. And I went um, from there as a young kid in the 1966 to Berkeley, um, which is another interesting experience, which we won't go into, but involved numerous tear gassings and, and, and occupations by National Guard. But um, I learned how to negotiate, actually, um, on my way through um, um, uh, police lines. But anyway, uh, what was interesting is I arrived in the School of Architecture, College of Environmental Design, with um, a very different background and approach to architecture, um, which at that time involved uh, uh, J.B. Jackson, uh, people like uh, Ale Chris Alexander um, and, and Joseph Esrick, a really crazy group of people who definitely did not agree, uh, which was, I think, very uh, e exciting. Also, there was this new idea called a College of Environmental Design, which I liked at that time because no one could agree on the definition. 
um, which I think unfortunately somebody's decided what it is. And I think what's great is not deciding what it is, but what the question is. And that was what always underpinned uh, my thinking, um, especially supported by the uh, my mentor, uh, Spiro Kostov, who uh, wrote actually some revolutionary uh, uh, urban histories. Um, but basically, uh, as a designer, I wanted to um, contribute to the world. Um, uh, I was heavily involved in the early days of the environmental movement, uh, yet one of many that's happened over the last number of years. But I was always asking the question, why are we doing this? And why is this a problem? Um, and then I began to, um, as I said, I, I was an architect. I did a number of projects. I worked actually for Larry Halperin for a number of years. Um, there were some very interesting people in the early 70s. There was a young guy from Seattle named Steve Hall who was working there. And he and I were working in a town called Flint, Michigan, which is a really tough place. Uh, I think before Michael Murphy was making movies about it, we were down there trying to work on the Flint River. But what was interesting about it when I began uh, fascinated with, with also a minor in urban history and in, in environmental history in the US, which I think is a very important baseline for any of the design professions is to understand the political environmental history of our, our Western society or Eastern society, urban society, is, is to begin to understand that there really are two definitions of design. Um, that um, there is the, the definition about making and making uh, the spaces to sort of represent the values that we wish to live in uh, here on Earth. Uh, and uh, that's what Mr. Jackson would say. Uh, but I also became interested in the other sort of quiet definition, which is really moved forward as fundamental today, and which is design setting, the terms by which we name and frame the questions to be addressed and how they'll be evaluated. Now, we used to call that programming which is a rather boring term. We used to give it away um, um, as planners and architects, or we would just do it as enthusiastic contributors. But now with sustainability, equity, all these other kinds of uh, sources of information, uh, the design setting problem is becoming more fundamental and actually critical to making any sort of making decision because we now see that setting and making are a continuum constantly iterating uh, backwards and forwards. That once we make something, we have to reset it. So I made a decision a number of years ago, both in practice and education, to stop um, building architecture. I had many of good friends who were quite good at it, and um, I thought it was great that, that more architects there were. Uh, it'd be easier to take on the problems rather than me trying to design everything. So I decided to go, what I'd say, upriver on the problem and to begin to try to understand why things are happening in that way. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is something I've been working on the last couple of years. I've really been reflecting a lot about what is uh, different and what is new uh, on our tables these days and what we need to face. Um, I'm really coming to uh, the realization that we're not in a period of recession where we're sort of waiting for things to get better and we're going to go back to the way it used to be. Uh, we are in a fundamental state of secession. And in fact, it's already changed. Um, and it's changed in such a way we have no idea actually what we're, we're doing. <laughs> and many of, of, of the things that we make assumptions are, are so volatile and so open, it's actually quite an exciting and scary moment. Um, so I've been working on what I think four basic themes on how we're going to um, approach the sort of physical environment of our city. And the fundamental agenda is the city. Um, and it isn't an urban-rural kind of dichotomy um, and all that. We can talk about that. And I'm going to kind of throw three projects in various different states. They've gone over a number of years to kind of show how um, I see these four thematics, these four um, design principles that under, underpin how we should be thinking as designers and citizens about how to approach um, the physical environment called our city. What I realized is that the um, biggest thing is that a lot of we are much more aware of this, but early on um, I, with Jane's work and others, a lot of people began to say is maybe we should uh, make the things that have been hidden all these years, um, bring it into view. So the whole idea of uh, daylighting infrastructure, you have to understand 25 years ago didn't exist. Uh, and in fact, there would be a huge argument about opening it up and people would drown and all kinds of chaos would happen. Attorneys would pop out of the walls and all kinds of things. Um, and, um, um, and 
So, in fact, I had done a project, of, an article about opening up the water systems of Los Angeles, and I submitted it to an urban design award, uh, and it was rejected because somebody said that I disrespected the idea of water because I was opening uh, the water uh, to the pollution of Los Angeles. And I was going, it's in a reservoir. So, it, it, you know, so there was this sort of notion of, of, of opening it up. So bringing things into sight also brings things into mind. And what I realized that I've been for a long time is actually a political landscape architect, um, which is a very particular understanding of how to design the boundaries, the lines of mobility, the things by which connects us as a community, which is somewhat of a planner, somewhat of an architect, somewhat of a landscape architect, but it also is not. It is very much focused on that. Um, it also has to understand the design, finance, policy, and implementation of things. So um, I've been sort of coming to that realization. So I think that there are four basic challenges that we have when we now approach a problem. And we saw it in sort of in spades today in the thesis. Uh, um, first of all, we have to understand that uh, a city is essentially a fiction, a giant fiction. Um, and that is based upon how we inaugurate um, uh, why we're there. Now, the word inaugurate, inaugural is very important. It's an ancient word. Inaugur, a Roman augur was the one who was the sort of soothsayer, the spooky designer person. There's the, um, the uh, other person, the, um, did I see the augur? I forgot the other. So, oh, the soothsayer uh, was the sort of the developer. The soothsayer would say, we need a fort over there. And the augur would say, here's the center and the edge. And therefore, you would inaugurate the beginning of a city by carving the land with a great big you know, a bull pulling a plow. Now, the shape of that plow was called an urv, or the origin of the word urban. So to dig the dirt and to carve and to set one piece apart means you make an urban, you're making something urban. Jeez, that's going to terrify the architects, but it was a landscape move. OK. so. <laughs> but that's all right. We'll get over this food fight uh, soon. Uh, we'll find out the issue so large it doesn't matter. Um, so in that process, we create this, as you probably can read in my book, Civilizing Terrain, the notion that we don't live on the dirt. We live in the terrain, which is an artificial construct that we belong here, and this is who we are. Okay? Now, recently, I've discovered in some research um, and this is the sort of inaugural terrain question. We have a vision of utopia at the top. You see the tree there sort of representing Buddha and the Bodhi tree and the notion of thinking and the sort of celestial heaven of the we belong here along with the oak tree on a hill where the sun and the water rotates around us. Uh, we are the center of the earth. And it's not a Vitruvian model. It's actually an environmental model of the notion that we, 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 this earth is for us. It's a very different. There's an, the guy doesn't fit in there in that way. The second one is we live in an existing um, geographic situation. Greece was started on a hill because it was great soil, made great pottery. There was also the hill was a big sandstone thing, collected water, water weeped out of there during dry season, great place to start a town. Now the problem is, is when the water disappears and pollution comes in, you're still united to that, that, that topography. So if you're in Venice, it's an issue. If you're you know, um, in Shanghai, um, there, you're in those situations. And when we get down to it, we gather those to those two ambitions and then we inaugurate a kind of baseland saying we founded this town. Now I think we, we saw it in Prince Edward Island which is a little flexible right now. Uh, it's really hard to figure out where the ground is. Now recently um, I was at the University of Washington in Seattle. There's a group there called I Hope. Uh, led by a series of scientists, geographers, historians who've mapped a hundred thousand year scientific and cultural history of, of technology and politics. On the right side is the evolution of technology, and we always forget, it's interesting, the development of technology starts with the domestication of dogs. That's very cool. You know, dogs started and then we got iPads. So it's you know, the reverse. Um, and then over on this side, on the, on the left-hand side, is the evolution of, of political landscapes. Essentially, uh, you know, our idea of how we should live in relationship to land, democracies, uh, you know, dictatorships, uh, Persians, Greeks. These are all ideas that get inscribed in the land. What's interesting are all the gases and water and forestation in the middle. Now, what's interesting, this area in the middle, all the colors, is that what scientists call the envelope of regu regularity, which I love, 
which is this notion of the present. Uh, and, and the envelope of regularity is, even though they say this is absurd because they're mapping nonlinear systems, they have to have some realm of predictability so they can say the sun will rise tomorrow morning. Now, as you've seen in the last couple of days, the envelope of regularity is kind of different in Toronto. I've never been up here where I've sweated, except with nine sweaters on. So, you know, the envelope of regularity starts really start whacking, gets really wacky, as you see, as it passes uh, the development of uh, 19, there's the uh, internet, is right here. And this is the a monsoon. This is really interesting. I show my Bangkok friends. Here's the monsoon going wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, 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 dry. Apple, uh, internet. <laughs> now it's raining in the middle of the dry season in Bangkok, which is a place that is only two and a half meters above some notion of, of level sea level. So that notion of envelope irregularity, essentially, this is really terrorized my historian friends. Everything we sort of know about the history of Beijing, the history of, of urban settlement and, and Europe, and the assumptions it base are basically no longer viable because they exist in another frame of reference of climate, weather, and so forth. So for anybody who wants to go back, uh, and they say, well, we should return to the back time the way we used to be and live that way. But we can't because the, the water, the gases, and the monsoon are in that place. This blew my mind. But I love this idea of envelope of regularity. Now, a big version of that envelope of regularity is, is to begin to understand is the way we divide, define the environment and landscape is the way we define what is urban. And this is my huge fight against urban versus nature. It's essentially, in my research and other research that people have done, is that defining nature is the basis by which we define what is urban. This gets you really gets really some urban people crazy. And this is actually from J.B. Jackson's essay called The Word Itself. Um, the first, of course, one is the definition of urban is a clearing in the wilderness. This is a safe place. We won't get eaten by animals. And those uh, goths and things that are out there, those people wear pants and, and, and have whiskers. Um, and I have lightning and, you know, in the distance. And the word travel is you may not come back, travail. So if you go out there, you may not come back. Um, that's about a 15th century, but that one's been a long time. The second one is the one we're still locked into, which is the sort of urban versus landscape. Landscape is seen. Uh, you see it all the time in an environmental language. We mitigate the impact upon nature. My favorite thing being is that little black fence along a huge construction site, and then a little stream, right? They just whacked off a mountain. They put a little plastic fence at the bottom, and then there's like a wetland, and they're mitigating the impact upon that. Uh, we still have this bifurcation. When I see the word and between urban and environment, I go, too late. We've got to get rid of the ands. The ands are a problem. There is no and anymore. And then the last one, as J.B. Jackson talked about anxious as early as uh, um, the late 1960s, was the idea that in landscape is an, actually a background infrastructure. In fact, there's an early essay, he referred to it as a megastructure in the early, early 70s. Some of you guys remember that cool megastructure stuff. When everybody was interested in systems, but systems that time was big and gnarly. Computers were huge. So, um, um, so you have, the thing is, all of that's in play. And I was working with some uh, trash people the other day. And you realize that, the, and, and even more interesting, is that um, the way we define trash is also the way we define what uh, way, uh, nature is. So what we value and don't value is also what we decide to throw into that system. So this whole notion of envelope of regularity. Now, the thing is, as I said, all those are in play, and we really don't know them well and um, how they intersect. The other part of this, and as you can see, I, I, this is going to blow your mind. I'll give Jane a copy of the PowerPoint so that you can get a big drink and go a little slower on this. Um, so I'll come back to the other way. Again, we have a global environment of the ideal city, and we have a local ecology that's sort of pushing backwards and forwards. And it's a pair of ideal landscapes. We. We want to live here in Toronto on the shield next to Lake Ontario, and we love the ecology in that way. But we also want to have this city that sort of has pieces of chunks from look like Chinese modern architecture landed down over here in the form of Danny Leapskin, and you've got you know new urbanist housing that comes from Germany. We're, we're putting all these things together. 
But remember, the things that I'm interested in is that we actually live in a pair of ideal landscapes between a political landscape, those things that define us. This is the whole problem of defining a site. St. Bernard's Parish is what are the boundaries? What holds us together? How do people feel connected? Property lines, our pants, uh, you know, all of those things. We don't think about them as design tools. Over here is the inhabited landscape, that thing that's very close to this. Uh, and we, we exist between those two things. What's interesting is they don't fit well together. And that's why we design clothes and interiors and landscapes and gardens. Right? That's what I'm learning is, is that you know products, all these things are designed because it doesn't fit well together, especially when we get a lot of these and a lot of that together. The second one has sort of been playing around a long time, coming off the idea of, of uh, William Cronin's book, uh, Second Nature, is okios is, of course, the Greek word mean echo, which is the root of economy and ecology. Everybody knows this one. Um, but what's most importantly is that I'm interested in the infrastructure of every day. We usually think about infrastructure in a sort of gargantuan manner, uh, sort of moving and hefting large things that's there. But what, what's in interesting is what Linda Nash, in a very important book on, on Central Valley of California called Inescapable Ecologies, about medicine, the concepts of landscape, and industrial landscapes of agriculture. And she makes a very interesting point. We should be looking at medicine in relationship to our understanding of what we think ecology is. Because at this time, in the settlement of the 19th century, medicine was based on humors, which is the notion that our bodies are transparent and we, you know, picking up vibes and energy. And, you know, this is before Gaia and, you know, these sort of moonbeam people from the Sedona. Um, and they really felt it. And in fact, some of the ideas of sustainability have embedded in that idea that the body and how, what we eat, the food, urban food things, all kind of, you know, kind of re reminiscent of this exercise. But we forget that when we start designing the notion of having an environment of a great city with wonderful food on the edge of Lake Ontario, we set up an ecology that is inescapable. We just can't simply say, oh no, we're stopped. So it isn't just industrial waste that's in the back. Um, here, it's you know, 40 years of agribusiness trying to turn a salt bed into the Mediterranean to produce raisins and uh, almonds in a salt flat. And now it's got all kinds of cancer swirls and so forth. So in histories, we never think about the fact that the plumes of history also drift. You know, Greece is still suffering from a thousand years of, of despoilization of, of the natural landscape. It isn't just beautiful and empty because, you know, it was that way. They destroyed the place. <laughs> you know, they, they ate it. They carved it up. They built ships out of all the trees. It's a very interesting idea. Um, and in that, of course, is the whole idea of infrastructure. And the idea is what's between the top and the bottom is this everyday uh, set of systems that form the urban habitat, which is my attempt to get away from the world, uh, the world of the world of housing, of density, of urban development. That what we are, if we bring nature and us together, is the two habitats come together and we're going to live together in these things between this exercise. Of course, an infrastructure requires an incredible social compact. This is not something that is free and that just sort of happens. There's a problem with the iPads and the iPhones is there's an assumption that all infrastructure is like this. It's completely invisible. We don't have to worry about it. We just get, you know, we can buy anything from eBay we want and it appears. I don't know how it got here. Amazon trucks. We don't see all that stuff flying around. Well, you can't get water this way. You're not going to get food this way. You're not going to get natural gas this way and so forth. So. When you look at all of that, and this was a drawing that's been around a long time, what's really exciting is we are kind of engaged in this dialogue that infrastructure is a cultural system. Though we're still doing it with our hands way off. We're still sort of touching it around the edges. We're not getting in fights about pricing, about allocation of resources and so forth. We're still sort of decorating the pipes. We're not de literally getting into it. And going back to that mission of landscape, in some regards, we still have this bifurcated view. Uh, I, this is my urban one. I have a little American house one for the American. This is the international crew. I put it, higher density housing in Unité Habitation. In the US, they put a little house, because if I put it in that, they'll think that's uh, low-income housing. Um, so, uh, but uh, it's very interesting, because I, people go, well, we don't have any buildings like that, so we don't have that problem. 
But if you look at it, essentially infrastructure is out of sight. Um, we, uh, we are playing on this. I don't have to do this much lecture as I used to. Um, but somebody said, well, what do you mean it's in the backyard? I said, well, infrastructure is mostly gray. And gray is not a color. And if you, make, you painted infrastructure purple, yellow, lime, green, everybody go, what is all this stuff around me? What's this doing here? We still set up the idea that somehow we want to look out the front as at some sort of natural landscape. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that the landscape is us, and, and that system is, is all in front of us. And of course, in your New Orleans, and it was rather precarious before, uh, and it collapses, uh, that, that, that housing there in the middle becomes an island, and you become completely isolated and disconnected from civil society. Uh, the problem is nothing in infrastructure from public policy down to this implementation literally cares how the user is doing. It's all about generation. And if you're a user in this system, that means you're the last person to recover. The first thing to be covered in New Orleans um, was the casinos. The last thing to recover was where the people ha lived who worked in the casinos. Interesting question. They had a real problem. They said, well, where are the people going to live there? Like cleaning the, the bedrooms. Um, they're out there. So the things that I've been looking at, the core of that um, uh, uh, urban habitat, the pieces you guys are really working on right now, is that the first layer is you're talking about cultural identity and civil revelation. Other words, is, can I have the sense of civility? Do I feel like I, there's a kind of civic ethic going on? If I'm involved in the St. Bernard's piece and, and I see that I'm in charge of the, the Violet Canal, is this going to make me proud? Is this going to make, bring an ethic home to me, uh, to, to uh, also bring home to where I live? It's also cultural identity, which is constantly dynamic uh, and, and, it, and adds new culture. Does it give me access to the commonwealth, which is the wealth that's in common, not just the larger commonwealth? It's not, not a territorial question. It's an access to what is all the wealth. So the question is, what is the wealth? What is available that people are getting to? And you're going to find an awful lot of bridges don't go to certain places. And also, as I said in a lot of reviews, this is really great, but what happens every day? If those increments aren't working, if management isn't being creative every day, I'm going to lose all those nickels and dimes or, or silt or, or, or granular kinds of things. And in landscape, it's really important because then the tree's not going to be nurtured. In architecture, we can sort of build a tough wall and you know, withstand change for about 10 years. And then the water starts working on it. Um, so how, how does that begin to drive it? So you see, I'm avoiding sustainability. I'm avoiding urbanism and so forth. Those are not useful terms. I want to get down to actually what is happening. The next level is a really complicated one. It's taken me a while to sort of uh, sort out. And that is the sort of local, global uh, kind of question. Of, of, of a here and there, what is the relationship between the neighborhood and the city, or the neighborhood and across the street, uh, citizens and so forth. And it really is, we've stuck in a thing in this bifurcated world of the and, of the large project and the neighborhood, neighborhood initiative community process. All very interesting, neither one of them can solve the problem by themselves. And this is, we can get into huge discussion about community agency or large project. But they don't generate by themselves systems that easily connect to each other. Ad hocism by itself can't get up to a certain scale. It might give four or five neighborhoods for an association. It can't get past that and start getting into transit system or serving water. A big project like you know we've been doing in all our cities for the last 30 years where we're going to go, really huge project, a stadium, a tower, or World Trade Center. And everybody will come and money will just flow out. You know, people will go, oh, this is fabulous, here's money. <laughs> Build a subway system and so forth. The problem is that 15 years to take the project, no one's been paying any money in the subway system. And the rates are going up and no one comes. So, so there's this meso level in the middle. But it's also, and I use this word very particularly, transactions. We use the word, I, I'm totally against the word intervention. Intervention is only to put your foot in the door. After that, you've got to jump that, drop that metaphor, and you immediately go, and then there's the word engagement. Fine, I'm engaged. But if I don't get in far enough where I can actually start transacting, in other words, communicate to you in such a way that I can receive your value, and I give you something, you give something, and we exchange it, and it's so good, I'm going to come back. 
So when you're giving a presentation of your work, you're not just presenting your idea. You have to set up essentially a transaction between you and the audience. And are, they, are you going to open up the door so you guys can figure out what to trade with? Because you're gonna, they're going to give you materials and, they, and, and vice versa. Because they're going to end up taking that project that you've done, that gift, and start transacting in that way. Now, some people will say, well, it may not come out as you thought. I went, yeah, that's really exciting. It might come out different. Now, one of the best books I've ever read on all of this idea of complexity theory and so forth, it's a really good book because I can actually understand what's being said, is, re <laughs> is, is a book by Alberto Laszlo Barabasi. He's a physicist. It's called Linked. It's a really good book. And there's all these good books, you know, about complexity theory and it makes cool maps and all that stuff. But the baseline is, is, is what he calls the party. You know how you go into a party, it's a friend, you walk over there, oh, there's Jane, that's really cool. And you sit there like, I don't know, any of these people over here, you know, Toronto faculty and so forth. And then at some point, Jane says, you need to meet somebody. And we walk across that space to the other side, and I find out Elise is from, you know, makes gumbo, and we're like having hug, and you know, we're, we're ready to go fry some gator. Um, and things start happening, making some communication. We find out we're cousins after about 20 minutes. And so what happens is, how does that happen? How does that dialogue go on? And how does it remain active? Because everybody talks about networks. We had this someone who wanted to do apps. But how does it keep going? How does it keep regenerating itself? This is really exciting. Very rarely have I heard anybody in the last few years in the landscape architecture talk about how they're going to plant the plant like this and over time my woodland will look like that. They always usually, unfortunately you look like architects. Here it is, the woodlot. Whoa, that's fantastic. 100 foot trees in, in, in an hour. Uh, and, 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 and vice versa. Now, one of the things that we did is, uh, I was in, in 2008, just to give you an idea of how I've been playing with this, it'll help a little bit, is I went with a colleague of mine, Michael Cohn, International Fair Director of our National Program New School, but he's also an uh, old friend, he was the head of the Urban Development for the World Bank. I was in uh, Kenya at the time of the election, Obama had an Obama pin, I was getting hugs everywhere. Um, this is a Matutu, which is a, a shuttle bus that runs around, you just jump in. It's Swahili for, we'll take another one. And they jump in there, and every bus is different. It has about 700,000 miles on this Nissan. And we're driving around, and they're all painted. But we were down there, and we were evaluating the UN Habitat's uh, ur uh, Sustainable Urban Development Program, which has hundreds of projects around the world. And they're all talking about sustainability, and I saw more pictures of the Netherlands than I've ever seen. And people were coming in from Bangkok, and they were coming in from Mekong Delta, they are coming from Bogota. It was really amazing, and I, all of a sudden, I came there to listen, and all of a sudden, we have to worry about the UN. When you show up, sometimes you fi find your, your picture saying he's going to give a lecture tonight, and you're like, oh, really? Um, so uh, all of a sudden, I was in charge of of doing a workshop on what sustainability was. And I found out that everybody was stuck on this program that they thought they had to make a particular thing with blue and yellow arrows and grass on the top. It was astounding because that was all the text. And then the other words were lead, platinum, newer, and there were all these evaluations. That was exhausting. Um, and, and smart growth, that's my other wonderful, hateful word. Smart growth. What, if we're not, you know, what is it, anyway? Uh, form code is another one, don't get me started. Um, so I'm sitting there going, and they're saying, does that mean we have to forget everything we've ever done? I went, oh my god, no. In fact, the run revelation was that all the projects, the one thing was they all agreed, you can only get agreement in a UN meeting, which involves you know, 30, 40 people, um, was that nowhere is the same. Which means, I said, ergo, a design or engineering solution does not, one does not fix all. So why are all the engineering companies like Arup and Uth running around going, showing pictures of wetlands with herons? Lots of herons, lots of herons living in places they never lived before. And they have no rookeries, which is my other thing. If you don't show me a rookery, I can't look at the heron. So I sit there and I say, well, maybe, maybe you ought to just think about sustainability as a prism. And I was saying, there's all the lines of what happens. And you take, and you've been using this triangle of equ equity, ecology, and economy. Not my favorite. It's a fractal. It's very hierarchical. But that's what they have. And maybe what happens, depending on 
your geography or your, your local uh, cu customs, the prism changes. It's the diffraction I'm interested in, how those things get deformed. And I said, the problem is, is, it, is that this fractal, this prism thing, is still based on the idea of integration being form and function. There's and again, right? I said, the thing is, is that we're really four legs of the table now. It's form, function, operation, and regeneration. So that old dichotomy of form versus function has been just blasted away. And that we're now into um, this prism. And I said, OK, they, that, 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 they were so happy. They said, that means we don't have to put grass on our roofs. And I said, you're in the Mekong Delta. Things are growing off of everything. Um, so you don't have to put sedum um, in Somalia. So, but I still, what I discovered was, and in the UN language, planning, management, and governance sounds like the most boring words in the world. They still were just trying to shove that down over this pyramid. And I basically said, well, sustainability, if you really take it to its heart, and if we really go into societal questions and habitat, we've got to get into a circle. So how do we go from a triangle to a circle? So to go from ecology to economy, we have to think about integrated design. To go to economy to equity, we have to think about constant inclusive operation, which means more than neighborhood planning. And to get from equity to ecology, which means things that happen every day, management has to become the most creative part of the system. Right? Being a manager is now going to be a creative piece, which is usually the dullest part of the system, the most underpaid part of the system. This got everybody really excited. They went away. We're working on a circle. We don't have to have any see them. So that sort of stuck with me in that notion of that transaction. How do we get this to operate? The last one is the creative commons. Uh, this one's also evolved around, and then this has to do with re regenerative practice. It also comes with a lot of work that I've been doing recently on the Internet of Things, uh, which has to do with control of information. Um, all of the stuff you all are using in order to get data, you may not have access to unless without you pay Cisco for it. We've been really spoiled. I've done a couple reports lately where I can't get certain data on New York because of Homeland Security. Won't let me get data on where the water filtration plant is for New York. I said, well, it's right over there uh, across the East River. Yes, but we can't give it to you because you might bomb it. Okay, I'll close the curtain. <laughs> But, you know, and then uh, Cisco, because it, and, and sensors and everything, is going to say, well, we own the sensors, therefore we own the data, so therefore you're going to have to buy every bit of information to do this. And in fact, we're going to give you the protocol on how it should be evaluated and whether it's toxic or not. And you're just going, what? I mean, I've, this is the last year I've just had my brain cooked and all this. So the Creative Commons is a big debate. I give you a book called Common as Air by Lewis Hyde, which is a, a brilliant book on this debate that essentially it's a control of internet intellectual property. It's essentially in the, in the 18th century, the idea of Franklin and others was that democracy is based upon an open intellectual property system. That you could have a good idea, but it isn't productive to the economy unless people gra grab it and hybridize it into their own system. But now we're getting into the point where, you know, you can't even, you know, suggest the word Coke um, without having to be branded. So the whole issue of branding. So this is, so the big part of our think submission, besides uh, doing a lot of other things in this with Raphael Vinoli and Ken Smith and Fred Schwartz and, and again, we organized this name after think because it really wasn't about us. It was about a huge challenge and how it is that people have been thinking about cities. This is what we need to do. And that this early diagram about remember, redevelop, and, and, and to um, evolve was all about thinking differently over multiple periods of time. And before it became into a political free-for-all, which it did, a very sort of angry uh, process, this is an eight-foot-long drawing that um, I was designing with um, Roman Vinoli, who's Raphael's son, we were going to develop a learning board for the World Trade Center. We felt that there, there is no market for real estate, showing that now. Um, there was a market for shopping center, which is odd. You have a memorial to the dead and a shopping center. It's sort of shop until you drop kind of thing. Um, and uh, and uh, it, I didn't, it's, I 
couldn't come up with a weirder combination. Um, but what's interesting is that we were going, there were so many interesting ideas about people wanting to share information. In fact, globally, we started getting information that we are going to create a great big um, a game board, essentially, called uh, World Trade Center, uh, the globe. And um, this was on the table until it turned into a big glamour game. Um, and then that tower was essentially going to be a subway in the sky, um, and that this game could be played uh, down on the bottom, and then you go up um, and with your metro card and plug into the city and find out where these things could happen. And in fact, the revenue from buying metro cards would have paid off the towers in about 10 years. Um, so the idea of a creative commons. Now, some of the things that are in play, landscape architects are involved in creating intelligent landscapes with sensors. Um, this is a very interesting intelligent landscape. It's a border in Afghanistan, uh, which is sensors to track certain people crossing over who might be carrying explosives. Uh, there's some very interesting websites now coming up called drone landscapes and so forth, and there's a bunch of uh, big Name, name brand landscape design programs that we won't mention that have really gotten excited about drone landscapes. It's really hip. Um, but it has a rather tough side. The other one on the other side is this map, the network of knowledge, with a group of Turkish immigrants who are developing through with a series of DIY uh, designers and hackers their own um, umbrella operational system in the Netherlands uh, through various different laws certain people can't get access to information without certain levels of acceptance in society um, so basically what these guys have done is picked up all the computers that have been thrown away reworked them rehacked them reprogrammed them and they're creating their own hotspots um, this is a beautiful hand drawing of essentially hot spots off of coffee shops where people are moving social services, access to employment. It's an amazing, amazing exercise. Um, so, four themes. I better hurry up here or we're going to be going into, you know, winter again here in Toronto. Um, Phoenix Public Arts Project has been around a long time in the, in the early 1980s, one of the first of its kind, in fact, the first, uh, where we developed a percent for art off of infrastructure. Um, the f f project prior to that was the Seattle Public Arts work, which was tied to 1% to building. So you couldn't build systems, you had to relate to a building. Um, through a friend of mine, Deborah Whitehurst, who was a resident, grew up in Maryvale neighborhood of, of Phoenix. Um, she and I were working, uh, Terry Goddard was the mayor of time, amazing guy, um, early 1984-85. I was doing work in Phoenix, we're doing some cultural work. Phoenix was just on the edge of growing like crazy. The uh, silicon boom uh, was about ready to explode. Um, basically, employment, labor employment was forced out of San Jose. And people like Motorola were moving five and 7,000 employees at a time to Phoenix, which means that 20 to 25,000 people will arrive in an area over an 18-month period, which is huge. So this was a snowbird town that was now moving to becoming one of the hot um, sort of backup spaces, Silicon and Los Angeles growth of, of technology. It's also a very interesting landscape. Uh, these drawings of mine, sort of a, a, a Phoenix mandala. That little diagram there, actually, the city's 450 square miles. The only way to deal with the city was to draw it small uh, on a big piece of paper. It just came so overwhelming, you went home. Uh, at the bottom, I started talking about the basic resources of freeways, of swimming pools, of palm trees, um, of water. Of, of weather called events because it comes so qu quickly and also $29 flights to San Diego so that you can be cool. All of these things feed into uh, this story. But Deborah and I were sitting around going, how do we get a place like this to understand the incredible rich culture of this place? She says, I said, but you know, it's if we tie it to the infrastructure. She and I had both grown up in a kind of irrigated landscape. And I said, you know, it's the canals we see all day long that, that is significant and people don't know why they're there. She says, I got an idea. Why don't we, is this a good idea? Let's tie it to the infrastructure bond issue. I know it's coming out next month. It will just write 1%. So we wrote uh, two sentences that the mayor slipped into the bond issue. Everybody said, oh, 1%, it's a billion dollar bond issue. Now this is 84, a billion dollars is a lot of money. So it's like 100 trillion now, I don't know. But it was like a lot of money. And it was getting ready for the huge explosion of growth in Phoenix. 
uh, it passed. <laughs> and so somebody said, wow, this is great. Let's make an urban design plan based on uh, um, infrastructure as, as public art and urban, and, and urban space. And I went, well, that's great. I wonder what that is. So uh, what we did was, this is the old days when we had Avery Dots. Remember those? Those are cool. I love Avery Dots. And um, this is before GIS. This is not 100 years ago. It's only the 80s. Um, but I went through and read all the boring documents for all the public works projects and all the agencies that are stacked this high and went through there and started sticking stickers and I had a code system of how many times everybody was digging up the same road. And I basically said, if we dig up the road once and do six things, well then we'll have all this extra money make a public space and the thing is, well, the agencies will never meet. And I said, well, that's all that's holding it. So the mayor told the agencies, meet or you won't get a budget. It's, you have to have somebody behind you. But the question is, how do I organize it? How do I organize Tons of projects, fascinating, completely winging it on the edge. Um, and so I said, so what's the story? What's the inaugural terrain? Um, this is actually a, a kind of Americanized version of a Spanish math showing the Zaha Madres, or canals, coming off the Salt River, which is a seasonal river. Phoenix is that one up there. Scottsdale's down, I mean, um, not Scott, Scottsdale's up there. This is uh, Mesa, Costa Mesa, not Costa Mesa, Mesa. And, and um, over here is Apache Junction. So ASU is right up there uh, near that mountain. The city is 1,600 years old. Native Americans um, are, uh, were actually involved in and, and, and cutting those canals and they had set up a settlement. So the first myth was that Phoenix is not old. But it was based on hydrology and dirt. And basically, that's all that happened out there. People on all-terrain vehicles running around um, having a good time. But I did notice at 5.30 in the morning in the summer, which is very beautiful, just before the ball of heat comes up, um, there's a, a bit of moisture. There was a bunch of people from Minnesota on a walk. Now, people in Minnesota go around lakes it's very important, and I don't know if these people ever return because there's no lake, so they go in a straight line, so they have to come back. Um, the, but they, they, they go on a walk, they have to walk around the water, and of course the canal says don't walk here and all these kinds of things. But to me, this was very familiar. I was going back to the canal. But what we did was not to represent it as the canal, but to represent it as a constructed environment. And my friend Grover Mouton from uh, Louisiana, I brought him in because he had never been to the desert in his life. Um, he was out in the desert in a formal suit and tie and a, and a scarf, and I was like, you've got to take this off. You're going to just die out here. And um, so what we did was what we called the sort of handle water music uh, approach to um, uh, the infrastructure. We basically converted the infrastructure with pas a set of pastels we bought in New Orleans. And we presented saying, we want to work on the canals. And they said, that's it. That's what is so beautiful out there. We went out in the morning, saw the sun, and that's what they see. This is what it looks like. That's what they see. So we said, yeah, that's great. And they said, well, we're almost done. I said, well. <laughs> There's a lot more color you need to go. Um, so basically, I came up with this story so that the mayor could go around with pockets. Now, I remember, like Christo says, it's great that Christo is that he's got everybody convinced it's good to write, wrap the Reichstag. In fact, he did it for 25 years. He got every chancellor from every party in Berlin and Germany to agree to wrap the Reichstag, which is a completely insane idea. And then finally, when he did it, it was almost anticlimactic. But how did he get him to understand it? So the mayor had to have a narrative. He had to go around and say, this is what the public arts plan is. Because we have a whole group saying, you know, it's a bunch of liberals coming in, wasting our public dollars. You know the argument. Um, there was a big debate over two kinds of statues that were important. Should it be John Wayne or Phoenixburg? This was the level of discourse. Uh, the rest of it was, you know, socialist, whatever, gay art kind of possibilities. So there was a lot of very interesting things. So we said, water. Without water, there's no city. Uh, with water, and you get shadow in the desert, uh, which means um, you actually want to go there across the land, and you begin to move about. Uh, you then have to have landmarks to know where the hell you are. And once you have landmarks, you may want to stop and see what's going on. And the mayor would go around and say, the Phoenix Public Arts Plan is about water, and we're going to have shadow. It's going to be really beautiful. And then we're going to go there and meet friends. And people would go, well, yeah. And he would sit down, and, and, and that would be the end. And they said, well, wow, OK. you know." And so we developed all that. What happened to the Z? But anyway. Um, 
we took all the projects and bundled them into what we called working zones, which are temporary things, which were gaggles of energy where things were going on already. It's always good to jump on something that's already happening and then add it. And that's where I learned about this whole notion of meso transactions, which is, hey, stuff's going on there. Let's get some more on there. And then you get in there and everybody's going, but it's, it's messy. And you go, yeah, no, it's messy. Let's, 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 I used to say, have a come to Jesus meeting and we'll figure this out. Um, and it's going to take a couple days and it may be hard and somebody's going to have to give in but if we solve this then we can actually move to Heather and somebody said well that means there might be multiple products I go yeah if there isn't multiple products then it, it isn't a rich habitat so things like this uh, this freeway Papago freeway was already under construction Marilyn Zwack who is an Adobe artist met Jerry Cannon who is an engineer who loved concrete they like bonded around mud um, they just didn't know what to do. Uh, they were digging the foundations for this overpass when they found the shards that represented an a, a, a Indian hieroglyphic of, of a frog. There must have been a wetland there, a seasonal wetland at some point. The neighborhood people who were really upset because they wanted to make this bridge a gateway adopted the frogs as their signature and it was a very mixed income community. Very, very mixed in and, and ethnically diverse. So they adopted the frog. They put the frog underneath the freeway as columns, and the engineers were upset, saying, you don't need columns. We figured it out. We got plenty of rebar. We just tons of rebar. We don't need any columns. If we have columns, our engineer friends will think we're weaklings. You know, we didn't do our job. Put the frogs in. They put the frogs in, saved the project, $1.5 million in rebar. $1.5 million went in to creating this a desert plant reserve where they tested native plants. It is now Arizona Department of Transportation. Out of this now uses native plants. What's really exciting about it is that the residents graffiti the bridge with adobe. And there are hieroglyphs all over it. People wrote their names and in fact Peggy Turner is blind left her cane. <laughs> She's going, I know where I am. You know, it's very fantastic. And I had a friend of mine who was a city manager from Miami, and he says, I love this. It's pre graffitied And you know what? No graffiti's ever happened on, on this bridge. And, and the neighbors change a lot. And there's, there's, there's Peggy Turney, a Turner as, as a hieroglyph. So the people can become the building material. The biggest project that I kept looking at from the airplane was the Solid Waste Transfer Center, this garbage dump, $15 million project. The engineers heard about the public arts program. They came in and said, look, we've done a public art. We hired an architect. That's the 80s. You can see that little hip roof there. It's pink in stucco, so we know it's in the 80s. And, and then it and followed my principle that infrastructure is all gray. Those are the gray boxes they said you can't see because the sun's too bright in Phoenix and you won't see it. So it'll just be behind there where we'll sort garbage. We got uh, Ron Jensen, the public works director, hired Michael Singer in his first project, uh, and Lynn A. Glatt got together and they said, why not, uh, you know, Ron Jensen says, we're not throwing garbage away, we're throwing culture away. And every time we throw culture away, I have to fill in the desert. I love the desert. I don't want to fill in the desert with the culture that we've thrown away. So they turned it in an educational center. There it is. Um, it's actually an education center people drive out. It's in the poorest neighborhood of town. Uh, it went from people wanting ready to sue to now one of the most progressive parts of town. Uh, to really tell you that, that we've transcended the, uh, the we've re-inaugurated this property into a whole new, new level into a generative landscape. The day this opened, uh, there was a black tie benefit with limos. You paid $150 a couple and it was called Dance at the Dump. And I went, it's very cool. <laughs> Did the merengue in the uh, dump site. It still is a very attractive place. People come out there, they get shredded metal, all kinds of stuff. And they've reduced, actually, the garbage. But what's interesting, the garbage recycling center on this end, this was just a gravel pit, uh, is now a, a center of eco business. And businesses who were live to the airport and want to go towards Scottsdale want to now go west towards Maryville because this is where green production is. Um, and and it's, it's just changed the whole economic balance uh, of the city. And more importantly, and Will Bruder is really excited about this, got the whole town off the Spanish architecture gig and they started making these incredible buildings based on light and air and shadow and all the five themes of the Phoenix art. The, how am I doing? I'm going a little long, huh? Am I all right? Let's slip two more thing in there. Just, all right, strap on. All right. Um, 
This is actually, in, in 1990, I, I led a group of students up the length of the Mississippi River from um, the, the Gulf of Mexico to Lake Itasca. Very interesting exercise. Um, and we could do that in Canada in various ways. But we talk a lot about North America, but we travel very little seriously in an analytically way. We spend more time analyzing pieces in Europe and so forth, or even China. And we do very little analysis of the origin of Vancouver or the origin of Calgary or, uh, or even where New Orleans is until recently. In fact, at that time in 1990, you could barely find a map of New Orleans. So we went the whole length. This is actually a, a drawing that I turned into a model and then I turned into a photograph. Um, and um, I never thought about digitizing it. It can rotate. But anyway, I can do that. Um, but what I learned a lot about this, and it sort of set me up for the climate change question, is what happens when we begin to understand that that inaugural train has made a fundamental shift? That the, we're no longer on the same planet. Uh, or I could guess the line from um, Judy Garland, we're no longer in Kansas. And, um, and then at the same time, so we're going to have all this huge shift. And so how do we compost this? How do we sort of make this productive? How do we make this exercise of major transition productive rather than apocalyptic? Now, what's interesting about it, and I did a lot of really interesting research on trauma, catastrophe, disaster, the origin of those words. Susan Neiman, is an incredible American philosopher, uh, wrote a book called Evil in Modern Thought. This is sort of wonderful romp into philosophy. Um, but it, there's a certain point in modern philosophical thought at the time of the rise of Kant and others, is that a major catastrophe happening in Lisbon. And um, it was at the point where prior to that, you know, God smoked the city, and that's why we had the tidal wave and destroyed the city. And then we've moved into the Enlightenment, where I say, well, if it isn't the gods, it's us. Why did this happen? And why is it during this tsunami and catastrophe, all the wealthy were killed and all the poor survived? <laughs> Very interesting story. So the Lisbon catastrophe really affected how we thought about nature, shaping a modern philosophy, uh, and so forth. Um, and what it does is essentially, it shows us that what we're living in is this remarkable fiction. And that essentially, it can be changed just like that. And so, you know, when you got down to New Orleans, uh, the legacy of not caring about the city, uh, the legacy of privatization, saying somebody else will take care of it, caught up with us. Not only in Katrina, but everywhere else across the country. Something our country will not talk about, and I know for a fact being on the ground afterwards, um, uh, that essentially something that the White House was definitely not going to let out in, into the public realm, even today. Um, but it was just a snapshot of what was coming future. Now, it also, what happens, what a disaster does, is to bring everything that we've been not wanting to pay attention to into focus. All these things existed in New Orleans. New Orleans couldn't build a sidewalk before the hurricane, let alone after. It was highly segregated. It was, somebody said, the ecology of food and music was disappearing. Chefs and musicians would no longer stay in New Orleans. And that's sort of like saying there's no more cabs in New York. It's like, well, I'm going home then, you know. I don't know about there's no more winter in Toronto but I, or, uh, <laughs> in March. Um, but, you know, it fundamentally takes all those issues and brings them into focus. And that's why a lot of people say, well, let's fix it and cover it up and let's get done. Because these issues still exist. So I'm going to jump and say, well, what happens if the same thing happens into Washington, D.C., which happened in, in 2008 with some friends of mine, um, Julie Bargman and others, is they were asked by the History Channel to say, well, what's going to happen in Washington, D.C. in the next millennium? And we said, what's going to happen in the next 20 years? Uh, we entered this competition. We had seven days to work on it, completely insane. Uh, we created a project that went into Union Station. It was competitive. Um, and so what we did is essentially did the same analysis I did of New Orleans um, and took this, projected out the sort of uh, uh, denial of infrastructure um, and also pointed out the fact that uh, Washington DC sits on a very bizarre site, a classic um, uh, uh, urban site 
uh, where it's built on marshland and water and this sort of notion of great commerce hub. Uh, Washington DC, this is actually that blue line is the uh, seven meter high rise. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, well, there'll be a boat, boat landing at Congress um, and all the whole um, Washington Monument and everything will be underwater. Um, it's essentially, this is, it's a water city. Uh, these paintings down here are very interesting. Um, these are 18th century paintings of Washington, D.C. As you can see, the topo has been raised a little high. They're selling real estate in, in Europe, so they're saying we've got really great landscape views of the water. They're not showing the size of the mosquitoes there. Um, and oak trees. Oak trees uh, are very important. Our oak trees in American mythology and real estate. Oak trees represent sturdiness and, and confidence and democracy because it was the American oak ships, Ironside was an oak, oak ship that defeated the British because our oak is stronger than weak English oak. So, see, plant, mat plant material is important, right? Yeah, you can, but it also represents longevity, permanence, and stature. So that isn't a homeless person, that's an entrepreneur. Looks like a homeless person, that's an entrepreneur. And there's infrastructure, a road, good roads, and lots of water come to Washington, D.C. The problem is no one cares anything about the infrastructure. The national government pays nothing to the support of Washington, D.C. Uh, it is sort of like having the Vatican in the middle of there, paying nothing. Um, next to it is Anacostia River. Um, off the branch in Watts Branch was a, a, a fellow named Marvin Gaye was born. Wrote the word, was song Mercy, Mercy Me Ecology about the degradation in the early 1970s of the Anacostia, which is so toxic now. Across the street, actually, there's new urban development. You can see you can buy condominiums at f half a million dollars. Form code, lead, certified, everything. On this side, if you fall in the water, it says, please go to the hospital immediately um, because of exposure to toxic waste. Um, whatever you do, don't touch a fish. Um, so all of this is playing here. And at the same time, an infrastructure, a sewage treatment system that hasn't been looked at since 1875, essentially has about another 15 year collapse. So I took all the infrastructure, projected it out, just sort of normal life, and there's a huge collapse point in the ecotone, a kind of critical threshold that happens just when the tidal system begins to rise. So what happens is um, when the tidal system goes and the water starts collapsing, Mr. Jefferson's tidal pond will begin to flood. So as we do in all uh, disasters in the U.S., we send in the Army. You see the helicopters coming in. And, and thank God Mr. Jefferson's there because we are all teaching UVA at that point. Um, but we decided to prepare for this. We we're going to create a citizen's manual for reorganizing the sewage and water treatment and biofuel systems of the whole city to move it from the west side of the city to the east side of the city. So as water creeped in, what we'll begin to do is as stuff rotted out, we would begin to farm it and begin to produce the biofuel, uh, the material necessary for the next generation, and to create new hubs, new circles in Washington, D.C., a city of hopes and, hope, hopes and spugs. I like that. Hope, uh, hubs and spokes. Um, so we started creating new centers. And from those centers, as the water began to rise and things began to deteriorate, um, it becomes more productive. We created this cool model with a little hand crank so that you could uh, create little energy. Uh, pretty soon, polluted rivers and broken food chains become purified. Uh, yes, we love our computers, it's fun. Um, we get food, get a new social capital, and what happens is essentially all the clean water and power moves from that end of town, which is wealthy, to this side, because in the poor side of time, They've got more nutrient-rich decay, and therefore they'll end up with more power, water, and sewer. And let me just sort of say, politically, we did not win this competition. We were very favorite, but there were just certain political people who didn't want to sort of set this argument up uh, in discussion. It was very, very interesting. They went, oh, no, no, we're not going to have that one. So that was fun. That was fun. Okay, last one. Reclaiming Cultural Territory, the project that I'm involved in right now with a whole number of people, Brian McGrath, Irene Lung, Plun, Plun Prim from Cambodia, is another sort of, takes me back to Phoenix, but other things of, of, of re-inaugurating the terrain. It's Cambodian living arts. Um, Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, sits on the Mekong River. Uh, this diagram is very important because you'll see this um, uh, Siem Rap is where Angkor Wat is. 
Um, and that big pool of water is where the temples sit that, you know, everybody, every Australian in the world flies in here, dries up there and has a kind of, or Americans do an eat, pray, love visit here. This, that movie has really terrorized the, most everyone in Southeast Asia. But um, ba those lakes are filled by the ebb and flow of the Mekong River, which at one cycle actually pushes water in all the way up and fills that lake and then it drains out. So there's this whole cycle of water that moves it. Um, it is a really interesting, it's kind of blurry, but I really love this uh, surficial geology. Um, Phnom Penh sits right here. Um, this is the productive landscape Mekong River. And you can see this whole, Phnom Penh is just tied to this whole sort of hydrologic corridor as it sits there. Really fascinating. Um, but this is another story. This is another catastrophe. There are many cities that have gone uh, through horrendous pain and memories. 1975, Pol Pot and Khmer Rouge came in, rounded up everybody, and drove them out of the city of Phnom Penh and every city and drove them into the countryside. Anyone wearing glasses was shot on, uh, shot on, on spot. Anyone intellectual, 97% of the intellectuals were killed. Uh, the, the buildings were empty, uh, memories were thrown away, and the city was abandoned. In 1979, the Vietnam, Vietnamese came back in. People began to slowly resettle the city. Um, but it's never sort of fully recovered. Um, and it's a city that is, is really quite amazing. We've been working with Plern to take use, to think about arts and water and culture, and not only to resuscitate um, the cultural identity of this city at, that it lost its past, but one, more importantly, a city that had no future. Um, I love this Mickey Mouse I've, and this cab driver. He was really great, um, fantastic. Um, but it also has a, a royal king who loves South Korean developers. Um, you have an old colonial city where you still find old sort of Frenchmen sitting in linen suits doing a kind of Joseph Conrad experience. I, a couple of days I wanted to join them, you know, for a little aperitif and sitting there and just kind of settle into the decay. Um, it's a city based on motorcycles. It is kind of returning back. Chinese are pouring in with development. But um, as you can see, it's a city that um, established uh, through colonial order. You can see these amazing grids. Um, but you'll see these pools of water, which are called monkey cheeks, which are tanks of water, which, which when you're getting these flood zones, the water can pour in, it can hold it, and then and they go out. And it sits on a large sand delta. Now, remember that, because that's really important. because. South Korean developers coming in under the global market of global, global sort of the culture knowledge thing have convinced the, the leaders of Cambodia they need smart growth, sustainable development, mixed income, all of these kinds of things. And they're proposing these new cities, which are actually being built. Actually, they slowed down given the world economy. This is called Diamond Island City uh, next to a casino, which is supposed to be the future of Cambodia. Um, and they're, to build them, they're filling in the monkey cheeks um, because it's cheap property and they're using sand from the Mekong Delta to pump it in there, which of course changes the hydrology of the Mekong River, which is now causing erosion on the edge of the city, and now the city has no place to dump its water. In the middle of it is this amazing man, Plern Prim, who in a series of other Cambodian artists who started making films about um, rebuilding their society. There's actually an amazing archive of films from the Holocaust. Um, have taken over a section of this incredible building here. This is a building designed by a French, Viet a French Cambodian architect, Van Molivan, um, uh, who built a quarter mile long building, um, which is, um, and, and this actually is gone. Now this is where a diamond island is. They filled this in. Uh, they're going to have that future city. This is an amazing building. Um, it actually is a very proud building at the time because it was a time in which Cambodia was a republic for a short period of time. So this building is really sort of seen as a symbol of Cambodia moving out of the village, away from the French, and creating this really amazing housing block. It's really fantastic. Now, over time, that housing block has, has decayed. And inside of it, um, there are prostitutes, there are business people, there are young families. But there is this 
organization that has taken homeless children, children left over from uh, the loss of families and so forth, and they're training in the Khmer arts traditions, and they're also bringing in new music, creating a whole new arts and culture scene, where I like to say the thrill of this is you are building a cultural landscape that is not an opera house, that you're doing it in the streets and in the communities. And in the middle of this building is these amazing people that have transformed um, this, uh, this neighborhood. And it's a symbol of a different way of building a city, which we call the Living Art City. We're having a conference in next year in April 2013. There's a thing called Seasons of Cambodia, which will be all over New York City. Please come. It'll be for two weeks. But we're talking about the next generation model. Now, unfortunately, and it's a fact, it's a reality, this building's going to be torn down. Um, it is, talk about green roofs, man. The air farms grow great here. You can have, like, grow one off your head uh, if you sit there long enough. They've been given this amazing building from the 1960s, which is also an incredible building, that will become their sort of rehearsal uh, place that's tied in the building to the Holocaust, which is where about cinema of Cambodia. And then across the street is the French cinema, and it's a section through the block. And this is going to be the generator. Inside this building are these spaces, and I'm kind of going, well, I'm not going to do anything to it. This building was occupied by the Russians in the occupation. These are films, uh, Russian films, Russian movie films, and also uh, French films. And then, of course, the building's eroded. There's all kinds of great things. I found this Russian poster um, so, so, uh, starring Vasily Borossi in a kind of um, Terminator view. I so wanted this poster. I, I wouldn't give it to me. Uh, and this building is going to be, we're going to help them renovate it um, into um, this art center, which will now be a hub of a network of centers such as this, where Art City on the idea of building culture on the street um, will be a network for all Cambodian cities because the cities don't see themselves as Phnom Penh and villages, they see them as a, as a network. So we'll end here on the Chao Prai in Bangkok. A Buddhist temple um, with the chatra at the top, the dome of heaven underneath, the waters of Apu below, and we exist 3.5 meters above sea level. Thank you. Big journey. Take I think we have time for a few questions. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh my God. All right, you got enough to work on your projects now? Yes. There's people in the other room. Scary. Um, Hi, Bill. Thanks so much for that talk. It was, uh, I, I definitely need a large glass of wine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, so I'm not a student here. I actually work nearby at an innovation center called Mars. Mm. And um, I'm leading the development of a new um, design lab there, which is called the Solutions Lab. And we're, you know, we've been steeped in complexity theory and design thinking and trying to make this not an academic exercise, but how can we actually shift systems um, in a very practical way. And so two things in your talk really stood out at me. It was um, one thing about the user experience and user participation. And the other thing that wasn't really explicitly mentioned, but you had sort of talked about it, um, skirted around it, was, was metrics and measurement. Right. So um, the notion around you know, this whole sort of design for um, systems change and getting the user involved at, an, at a way earlier stage is something that we're seeing as a theme in this work. Um, a lot of people that are using design thinking, you know, brought about by a, a lot of people in sustainable design, not just by IDEO and other product Bye. innovation centers, um, are saying, you know, we have to design these systems with, not for the end user. And I'm wondering, you know, I want to see in all respects, landscape architecture and architecture more generally is sort of my idea crush if I had gone back to school and done anything else. And I'm wondering as a citizen, like how I can participate. And I still feel like it's a pretty closed system. Like I think that there are a lot of sort of um, 
cool little things going on in, in the city in particular, but they're still so fringe. Like, I'm not really sure if there's good examples of big architecture firms that are saying, you know, here's your entry point to, tar to participate, because it is still such a sort of silo of, of very well built up knowledge and expertise. Um, my second thing is, the, well, a question I, around metrics. That's bigger than my lecture, yeah. Sorry, so okay. no, it's okay. I'm j I'm, there are more no, provocations. I'm points, wondering yeah. where, where, like in your projects and in your personal work, um, where have you invited the participation from users? So is it in the concepting phase? Is it afterwards where you're, where you're asking users for their opinions once it's already built? I'm just sort of, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get that. Well, first of all, um, I know IDO's work and Roger Martin's. There's no such thing as users. You have to get rid of that word. As soon as you use word user, then there's a separation. And there's this sort of notion that um, they're just someone who they're temporarily. Um, uh, Phoenix, they're involved in the whole process. There's, there is no front end. It's all, it's continuous. There's a constant loop of understanding from a metric as the capacity of that individual and the capacity of other individuals to tie, to produce what needs to be done. Most financial calculations, most business management plans don't really analyze the capacity of the, the people that are out there being asked to participate. They're only thought of as customers that are going to pay rather than capacity to be able to do certain things, which also means they also, what they do every day has to be in that formula to be a participant in the city. The way, way jobs are set up right now, you're not actually supported to be an active player in the production of the city. You're actually penalized. So you have to eliminate the word user. They're owners. And they run it. They're the generators. And uh, most companies don't like the end to be a generator because then they can't control the price as much as they want. They also have to understand the system is more complicated than they want to. So most systems designed, as you get down into them, are not very robust. They're pretty standard. They're not hybrid. They're not mixed use. They're not really clear about intention. They're very single-minded. And they're also not open-ended. They're very fearful that something might happen that they can't control. So uh, the first step is eliminate the use, the notion of the user. And you also have to understand the intention of the audience. What is their capacity? In Phoenix, a whole group of people, uh, once they understood what we're doing, they said, look, we've got to go to work. This is great. We're on board. Go forth. Don't, don't bother us anymore. We got it. We're totally into it. Let us know when you get to a certain point, we'll help you, because we get it. We understand what you do. But I had to explain to them, because they thought I still did blueprints. I said, well, I haven't done blueprints in a long time, but, but uh, so, so, you know, and, I, and from the design profession, that design profession is just a terrible job in what we do. Uh, we don't explain all the stuff we do to set it up. We're still, you know, thinking about the end. Um, so it's a very multifaceted you know, question that you have there. But the key piece is to eliminate the word user. And if you really get into that, like that network system that I showed you of the Turkish immigrants, that was a system being produced by producers who are interested in the production of knowledge, rather than users reducing their impact upon the system by being more efficient users of light bulbs. Completely different system. And all the design thinking of IDO is still on the, uh, mitigating the old system. Very clever, really smart. It's just mitigating the old system. They're still sending out stuff. They're still producing Internet of Things. Can you tell the story about the radio phone-in show in Minneapolis with the lady with the vacant house? I w there was a, a beautiful example that you told me about once that involved vacancy in either Minneapolis or St. Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting story. Because okay, yeah. I think that's a very interesting yeah. example of, of, of what the, um, the, the, the person uh, who just asked uh. the question is talking about. And, and this is where we get down to more of a basic level of understanding how we want to live rather than doing things. Uh, we were working, again, a, f a first ring suburb. We did some very early work in the 90s about housed the first ring suburb, which did, we'll say, quite well for 45 years. I'm not going to get into criticism of suburbs. Produced some cool people, you know, Steve Jobs, all kinds of things. Kurt Cobain, well, not some, yeah, a lot of garage bands. Um, 
we were we began to realize that if you started at a certain time, you could begin to help people migrate out of their existing situation into the next generation, especially aging, which is very difficult. And I was on the radio talk show, which I really love. I, you know, it's really kind of cool. You get a headphone on, people call and give you a question, and you just go, I'm sorry, I don't know how to bake that. Uh, they ask all kinds of questions. But she said, I really want to do this. I don't want to renovate my house. I can't find anybody to sell it. I can't buy anybody to rent it. Could you help me with an attorney so that I could give it to my kids? And I thought, she said, that would be a real urban design plan. I went, I'm the one with the degrees. And I'm sitting there going, you're right. It, they didn't know how to do it. We don't know how to go through the process. The process of setting up is not really set up for us to migrate. We have two methods. We rent or sell. And basically, we have to be people who are really vital and clever to do it. It's really complicated for people to move through this system and make it viable. It's really expensive. It's stressful. And so what we did actually work with the city is the city got together and set up a building inspector, a positive building inspector, people who come with renovations, and also an attorney to help them set up estates. A public attorney to help them understand how very early to move their funds into their kids so they could live in their house. And I thought, what a great idea, succession. We're not set up in that way. We're still buying and selling products. That's good. Thank you. Now you can have your drink. <laughs>